Tonight, Michael Gove tells the COVID inquiry we locked down too late and says sorry. He also sent a WhatsApp message saying we are effing up as the government revealed during today's evidence and sent to Dominic Cummings at the start of the pandemic. Also tonight, the moment Labour MP Sarah Champion found out her backbench campaign to help keep children safe from sex offenders has been taken up by the government. And we'll have the latest on the extraordinary diplomatic row with Greece over the Parthenon sculptures known as the Elgin Marbles and look back at some other diplomatic snubs. All that and more with Alyssa Kearns and Ben Bradshaw who will be with us for the next hour. It's Tuesday, I'm Sophie Ridge live from Westminster and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. Imagine all of your WhatsApps being made public. Now, one of my Sky and Westminster colleagues, who I won't name, don't worry, Sam Coates, told me if his were released, it would be a total bonfire. And honestly, there's probably not many of us who love the thought of our private messages being revealed to the nation. But then we probably haven't sent the kind of WhatsApps that Michael Gove did while trying to protect the country during a global pandemic. I don't often kick off, he wrote, but we are effing up as a government and missing golden opportunities. Now, I think the reason we all get a bit shivery at the thoughts of our private correspondence being released is that it's the unvarnished truth of what we really think. And I guess that's also why the COVID inquiry has been so disturbing, because if what senior members of the government really think is that they're effing things up, well, that's really not great when you're literally talking about life and death. Well, our political correspondent Tamara Cohen uh, joins us uh, now. Tamara, you've sat through a lot of this inquiry, uh, but today really was something. Yes, it was. Michael Gove was basically the minister at the Cabinet Office who was the centre point of all of the government response to COVID. And he had this realisation basically in late February, early March 2020, that it was all going completely wrong. First of all, when he spoke to the inquiry, he said he wanted to offer an apology. And he is the most senior member of the government to have addressed the inquiry so far. We haven't yet had Boris Johnson or Rishi Sunak. He said for everything that went wrong, he said that the victims and their families deserve to hear him say sorry. Then we can hear what he said to the inquiry just at the very start of his evidence. I want to take this opportunity, if I may, my lady, to apologise to uh, the victims uh, who endured um, uh, so much pain, the families who endured so much loss as a result of the mistakes that were made by government in response to the pandemic. And as a minister responsible for the Cabinet Office, and who was also close to many of the decisions that were made, I must take my share of responsibility for that. Um, politicians are human beings, we're fallible. We make mistakes and we make errors. And I'm sure that the inquiry will have an opportunity to look in detail at many of the errors I and others made. Now, it's interesting, he was quite defensive about Boris Johnson. He said it wasn't just the Prime Minister who made mistakes, he said everybody made mistakes and had to own up to them. But quite clearly, he was in the group who was very much saying at an early stage, look, this is going to be very bad. I mean, just look at these WhatsApps that he sent to Dominic Cummings. This was on the 4th of March, so a good couple of weeks before most of the government was galvanised around the idea of a lockdown. He says, uh, I don't often kick off, but we are effing up as a government, missing golden opportunities. I will carry on doing what I can, but the whole situation is even worse than you think and action needs to be taken. Dominic Cummings replies, agree. He then says, they said they had a plan. He said there clearly wasn't one. And he then goes on to say, people should be shot. And Michael Gove continues to discuss who that might be. So these are two men who are realising something terrible is coming down the track. He's trying desperately to warn number 10. When COVID does finally hit, and Michael Gove says we were too late to lock down, both in March and then again in October, he says there clearly were mistakes made. And here he lists, in hindsight, what those mistakes were. I believe that we were too slow to lock down initially, in March. I believe that we should have taken stricter measures before we eventually decided to do so late in October. I believe that uh, while it was admirable that we succeeded in building testing capacity so quickly, 
that uh, the strategic approach to who should be tested and why and what our tests were for um, was not as rigorously thought through as it might have been. So he basically thinks there were some very serious mistakes made. And what is interesting is, again, in January, the feeling you get is that he's saying to Boris Johnson and other people, we're doing it again, we're waiting too long again. He sent Boris Johnson an email from his Gmail account on the 2nd of January, which he said was his unvarnished views, telling him not to let schools reopen. Boris Johnson, you'll remember, let them reopen for a day and then they had to close again. So he's saying that he was very much hawkish on the lockdown, but clearly... A lot of what he was saying uh, wasn't agreed with by others at the top of government. So it'd be very interesting to see what Boris Johnson and others say in response. It is going to be. I mean, it's going to be an absolute blockbuster week, isn't it, if that's the right word to use, at the COVID inquiry. Boris Johnson, as you say, Rishi Sunak, we haven't heard from Matt Hancock, well. who uh, Michael yeah. Gove was quite defensive of because they were on the same side pushing for lockdown. Mm, really interesting. Tamara, thank you very much. Uh, Tamara Cohen there. Right, let's pick up, shall we, uh, with our guest tonight, the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Alicia Cairns, and the former Labour... Cabinet Minister Ben Bradshaw, good to have you here. For me, it's really weird watching the COVID inquiry because I was interviewing these guys every week during the pandemic and what they were saying on air is so different to what they were saying behind the scenes. I find it quite hard to kind of get my head around it almost. Well, I think there's always a difficulty in that privately you can have an honest conversation. Our job as MPs is to challenge each other. We, you know, we were just like here talking about how we're going to get a piece of legislation through that we both want to get done. But publicly, particularly at that time, your job was to reassure, your job was to try and calm, but also you didn't know. I mean, none of us, I've never lived through a pandemic. Um, so there will be lessons to be learned. I think it's really important the inquiry finishes and then we will have to make sure we learn those lessons really quickly. Um, I think it is important that we try and take away some of the razzle-dazzle and focus on the science and the medicine and actually what should have been the right political decisions because we actually can't really afford to delay. Mm. I take a slightly less charitable view than that. I completely accept that uh, the role of government was at the time to <clears throat> reassure uh, but also uh, to be open with people mm. and to make the right decisions and I thought what was very interesting about the candor we saw from Michael Gove today, refreshing candour, is that Michael is one of the kind of more libertarian conservative po politicians who was very hawkish on lockdown. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, he obviously he fought for that and uh, sometimes he won, sometimes he lost. But those decisions had a real life impact, as you said in your intro, on, on people's lives and deaths. And, uh, you know, we've got a long way to go in this inquiry. It's a sorry old state of affairs, though. The uh, part of the messaging between Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings mm. is talking about the kind of mechanics of government at the Cabinet Office, basically saying it's not fit for purpose. Mm. Is that something you recognise? I think for a long time there's been questions about how best we respond to things. So, for example, you know, the National Security Council. You know, at what point does a pandemic become a security issue and actually should we be seeing it through that framework because it activates a whole other level of government engagement mechanisms. You know, there's a very clear platform and route that you follow. Um, I'm not an expert on what we should be doing, but I think there are real questions. The mechanics of government mm. is one of the most important things because also we've never had the politics of WhatsApp or the governments yeah, of WhatsApp the thing, until yeah. the last few years. Um, and the reality is it's great that we can now speak to each other at enormous speed when we need to urgently, but it also slows down the sometimes reflective thinking that space probably gave people in the past. I mean, I, I, I agree with that, but I, I do think that the culture of government is set from the top. And although Michael Gove was understandably, because he's a loyalist, he defended uh, the Prime Minister. The rest of the evidence in the inquiry has shown quite clearly that Number 10 was dysfunctional under this particular uh, Prime Minister. I, with Michael Gove, part of me thinks he's going like, oh, I think Boris Johnson is, a, is, is really excellent and did a great job, but these decisions that he made, and I was against the whole way, I really want to apologise for them because they were the wrong ones. I kind of think that on the surface he's being loyal, and the same with Matt Hancock, but underneath, it's like, I'm not so sure. Yeah, which begs the question as to why he kind of tolerated him being Prime Minister for as long as he did. Mm. How careful are you guys with your WhatsApps? I'm, 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 pretty, I'm, I'm pretty conscious mm. of, of WhatsApp political WhatsApps, I'm not family ones, but political WhatsApps, uh, mm. uh, that I'm pretty conscious that anything I put on one could be uh, leaked um, mm. uh, by an unfriendly colleague or uh, someone or else. supposedly so, friendly. Or and friends, this, and this, yeah, <laughs> those are the worst ones, Yeah, right? but you have to work on the base that every single WhatsApp you send will be leaked. 
But I, I really struggle, you know, I really need to be part of a team and I mm -hmm. need to have colleagues who I feel I can trust and who can be my friends. And I think often actually you end up making closer friendships with people from the other side of the aisle because they're not trying to stab you in the back to get a job or trying to throw you under the bus in some ridiculous warfare between your party. Um, and so I definitely struggle sometimes because it, that relationship matters to That's me it. so So much. you're basically saying that actually it's your fellow Conservatives who you feel more out to get you than, than Labour? Well, they're the ones that you're in WhatsApp groups with discussing policy mm. and going, is this the right policy or is it not? But at the same time, it's great that we're having those policy discussions. You know, you don't want a party where there's not mm. active debate about it. And we have a lot of active debates on our side of the house. Um, but it'd be better done in person rather than WhatsApp, ideally. It's a really useful communication tool and particularly for campaigning and, and on the campaigns like that. Uh, but if you want to have a really, really difficult private conversation, have a call or meet in the park. Meet in the park. <laughs> <laughs> like the old spies. Good to know, Ben. <laughs> um, thanks both very much indeed. Uh, now, I wanted to show you something a little bit different because it did feel like the kind of thing you don't see that often in the House of Commons. Uh, back in 2020, the Labour MP Sarah Champion found out, uh, out about a loophole in the law that means registered sex offenders can change their name and avoid detection. Well, since then, she's been campaigning to get it changed. And earlier, over in Parliament, there was an unexpected update for her from the Home Secretary. The government will also bring forward amendments to the bill to restrict the ability of registered sex offenders to change their names in certain circumstances. Following the consideration of the responses to our consultation, which closes on the 30th of November, we also plan to bring forward amendments to provide for a legal duty to report child sexual abuse. Walk <laughs> of course. Yeah. I'm incredibly grateful that the um, Home Secretary is bringing forward legislation around sexual offenders changing their name by default, mm -hmm. but we couldn't find it on the face of the bill. So is there any reason that there is a lag happening with this? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, it, it's because we'll have to bring it through uh, as uh, an amendment. I can assure her that we are committed uh, to making this work. Fire amendment. It's a government amendment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I disapprove of theft in all, ex in all circumstances, <laughs> except for when someone brings forward a truly good idea. Thank you so much for being on the programme uh, this evening. It was a lovely moment in the House of Commons. You don't always get that. It felt like a, a genuine reaction from you. It was a genuine reaction. I I've been campaigning on this for uh, three years, and thanks to Sky for also really sort of pushing the need for law change when it comes to sex offenders changing their name. Um, and uh, I had no idea that the Home Secretary was going to actually bring it forward. So I was sitting there waiting to do my uh, speech about different issues and one of them being why he hadn't included my amendments. And then he was speaking about it and I was just incredulous, delighted, incredulous uh, and rather taken aback. I loved your little dance. It was a good little boogie that you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what people don't understand. I mean, I've been working with um, survivors, particularly Della Wright uh, and uh, the Safeguarding Alliance, for three years now on this. They've been working for five years, and it becomes really personal. Um, and, and we do... I, I know that people see PMQs and we get the sort of the spats and, and all of that kind of stuff, but that's drama. We, we do try and work in a cross-party way whenever we can. So it was genuine delight and gratitude. Uh, now, though, he's actually got to deliver on it, and I'm going to be there to try and help that as much as I can. <laughs> I like that, too. Just a little warning shot. You know, the work's not done now. I need to get it through. Um, <laughs> your cross-party point is an interesting one because, you know, I do feel that often we see the two different, you know, front benches going at each other, we see the knockabout at PMQs, we see the source quotes trying to rip each other apart. But is there much cross-party working together in the House of Commons? Oh, absolutely huge. Um, I mean, I'm a backbencher uh, and I've managed to make in the... It's 11 years tomorrow uh, that I was elected. And in that time, I've made lots of law changes, I've made lots of changes to guidance. And... Uh, my side isn't in government. The only way that I've done that is by presenting uh, a well-reasoned, well-researched argument that the government have gone, yeah, OK, we get that. Because um, whilst there is the pantomime, 
I, I genuinely believe almost every MP is here because they want this country to be better, um, because they want it to support the people as much as they can. And so anything that actually makes a difference and is reasonably straightforward to take forward and doesn't cost too much, um, the government's always been open to that. I also wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, what drives you as well, because for me, it seems like you're an MP who's so rooted in your constituency and the conversations that you have, particularly, I guess, with women and girls in the seat and the area that you represent. Why is it sexual offences in particular? I mean, it's an obvious question in some ways, but it's good to get you to explain it. Why is it that sexual offences in, in particular has been something that's really driven you in terms of being a legislator? I mean, literally, it's my 11th anniversary of being an MP tomorrow, and I would not... I mean, A, I wouldn't have thought I'd ever be an MP because when I turned on the telly, it, it was never people like me from a comprehensive that were the MPs. Um, but B, if I was going to choose a topic, I would never have thought it would have been child abuse. I mean, I came from running a children's hospice, so um, people abusing children is, is just so abhorrent to me. But I take very, very seriously that my job is to represent my constituency. And so literally within weeks of becoming appointed, I was starting to hear about the child sexual abuse that was going on in my constituency, um, that people were turning a blind eye, that it had been going on for decades. And I get paid to represent my constituents and hopefully make Rotherham a better place for them. There was no way on my watch that I was going to turn a blind eye on that. And then when you start to... Uh, understand the scale of the abuse and then realise it's happening nationally and internationally, um, it, you, you can't turn your back on that. You have to keep on going. And it, it's also... It, it's not a pleasant topic to be in, so I can see why others shy away from it, but that doesn't mean to say that we don't need strong legislation around it and the people that are working in this field don't need our support to try and protect all children. So um, it, it's not a choice, it's a necessity for me to keep on going with this. Well, thank you very much, and um, congratulations as well for getting your law changed through. Thank you. Thank you so much. Still to come on the Politics Hub. James Cleverly may have made Sarah Champion happy, but there's anger from his own benches over rising net migration. And some noisy support for his junior minister, Robert Jenrick, has he lost his party's trust after just two weeks in the job? That's next. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent, and I'm based here in Beijing. My most memorable story was covering the extreme zero COVID restrictions. A massive COVID wave is sweeping this city, but officially, almost no one has died. This is essentially the epicentre of the epicentre. It's the Haiju district. The message from China is clear. This is a modernised military, absolutely able to fight an international war if needed. This is a routine exercise, it's defensive in nature. My biggest challenge is adequately telling the stories of the Chinese people, even when the authorities would prefer me not to. Hey, hey, hey. By the rules, we are allowed to film in the streets. Go to the left, to the left. I will always remember the atmosphere at the Shanghai protests. It was an electric mix of excitement, fear and defiance, and a sense that history was being made. It's hard to express just how incredibly unusual these scenes are in China. There are people who are afraid. On the streets of Xinjiang, there is still a tension. Heavy police, a sense they're always watching. It's really an incredible eeriness to this place, and it just is completely abandoned. The Chinese housing market, for so long a driver of growth, is now a real liability. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's actually hard to describe the cold here. It's so intense, it literally takes your breath away. I can't tell if I'm moving it or it's moving me. But it's a very strange feeling.
Right, it's been a pretty busy day on the Politics Hub. Lots of coverage of the COVID inquiry, of course, as we've been discussing. Uh, but also, let's have a look at one thing we didn't talk about earlier, which was... Uh, Michael Gove saying there's a chance that COVID was man-made. Now, it kind of came out of nowhere when he said that there was a significant body of judgment uh, that the virus itself was man-made. Now, of course, that is not the government position. That's the, the WHO needs to continue to examine all possibilities. Right, let's have a look at this next story, shall we? I'm stretching up tonight. OK, here we go. Uh, this story is really heartrending, actually. Uh, one in three households with children struggling to afford a family Christmas this year. Now, that is according to YouGov polling carried out on behalf of the debt charity Step Change, which found around 8% of the population, 4 million people, will be relying on credit to cover their costs over the festive period. Next story, let's have a quick look at tonight. Uh, I want to bring you this analysis from our political editor, Beth Rigby. It's on the Elgin Marbles. We'll be talking about that later on the programme. But Beth says that Rishi Sunak was meant to stand for professional grown-up leadership, but this isn't really doing much good for his reputation on that and Britain's standing in the world. So we'll find out a bit more on what I guess linked to that later on on the show. If you scan the QR code now, you can catch up with all of the latest on the Hub throughout the day. Now, Labour was granted an urgent question in the Commons after the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, failed to deliver a statement yesterday on the soaring net migration numbers, despite government briefing that he would. The Shadow Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, began the UQ by asking, where is the Home Secretary and what on earth is going on? And there was a bit of disquiet, shall we say, from Conservative backbenchers too. Uh, but in contrast to their views of James Cleverly, some of them were much more supportive of his junior immigration minister, Robert Jenrick. Our surprise at Chief Political Correspondent John Craig joins us now. John, what happened? Well, I can tell you that it's still going on, the attempt to win over Tory backbenchers, because uh, we've heard in the last year or so about fizz with Liz, that's Liz Truss. The weekend we learned about lagers with Lee, that's Lee Anderson. As we speak, it's jars with James. Well, glasses of wine anyway, because James Cleverly, the Home Secretary, is, as we speak, in the Home Secretary's big office in the ministerial corridor behind the Speaker's chair. He has invited 50 Conservative backbenchers, nearly all from the right of the party. Those MPs who yesterday in Home Office questions and today in that urgent question that you mentioned been demanding tough action on Rwanda and also on getting net uh, my migration down. Uh, he says, Mr Cleverly says, oh, it's just it's routine engagement with backbenchers. He claims this is the fifth meeting he's had with Tory backbenchers in the short time he's been uh, Home Secretary. He says he's meeting the One Nation group of more moderate Tories uh, uh, next week. But this is all about trying to win over those re potentially rebellious Tory right-wingers. And today they piled in on Mr Jenrick in that UQ urgent question and uh, followed uh, Home Office questions yesterday when he, Mr Jenrick and Mr Cleverly got a tough time from the same backbenchers. What was remarkable today, though, in the chamber was just how amenable Mr Jenrick was to the, to the demands from those right-wing Tory MPs. Listen to this exchange between Mr Jenrick and Lee Anderson, who, of course, is a Tory deputy chairman. People in Ashfield have had enough of this. 7,000 people on the council house waiting list. People struggling to get a GP appointment. People struggling to get a dental appointment. Struggling to get school places. It isn't about time, Minister, that we had a cap on migration and put some clear divide between us and that lot over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, sir. Well, my honourable friend who represents a constituency near to mine speaks for my constituents as he does for his in saying that the British public wants us to get on with the job now and bring down the numbers coming into this country. The Prime Minister, the Home Secretary and I are committed to bringing forward a set of fundamental reforms which I hope will do uh, achieve the objective that, uh, that he's set out. Uh, there are definitely uh, strong arguments for using caps, whether in, in general or on specific visas, uh, but these are conversations that we need to conclude within government. Now pushing ahead. With well, Mr. Cleverly will be, be pressed on those uh, conversations uh, when he meets, the, or he is, when, while he's meeting those Tory backbenchers. Some of them are pretty arrestive. Uh, some of them uh, want a cap, as we heard from Mr. La Anderson there. And, uh, and uh, 
the, the signs from Mr Jenrick are that he's open to uh, uh, what's been described as a full fat legislation, uh, a really tough uh, leg piece of legislation on Rwanda, ignoring the uh, European uh, Convention on Human Rights and uh, blocking the courts from overturning government measures and so on. Um, plenty of wine bottles been ordered, I'm told, 50 MPs invited. Well. We'll see uh, if they are placated by uh, the, uh, whether it's the warm white wine or the chilled white wine, I don't know. But uh, Mr Cleverly is doing everything he can to win over Tory backbenchers in the short time since he succeeded Suella Braverman as Home Secretary. John, thank you very much uh, indeed. John Craig there. So, Alicia, you weren't, you weren't invited to jars with James, then? I had a far more important date, Sophie, so uh, <laughs> that was not happening. But uh, James is coming before the One Nation Conservative MPs next week. Uh, I'm a proud member of the moderate wing of our party. Fair enough. Uh, now, I did also want to speak to uh, you guys while I've got you about an ongoing story that Sky News has been uh, reporting on tonight. That's the sale of the Telegraph, so the Daily and Sunday Telegraph newspapers and the Spectator magazine. Our city editor, Mark Kleinman, has been reporting that Whitehall officials are weighing up on whether to issue an edict known as a hold separate order to prevent the Barclay family reassuming control over the Daily Telegraph once the 1.16 billion loan is repaid. That is an Abu Dhabi-backed consortium, Redbird IMI. So the reason it's been causing controversy is because the Telegraph papers and the Spectator are seen as influential within conservative circles. If the deal goes ahead, they would effectively become foreign-owned. Um, Alicia, you are chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Ben, your former culture secretary. I mean, what's your position on this? What do you think? I mean, this is more of an issue for the Tory party because the Telegraph is kind of a Tory cheerleader. But I think for the nation as a whole, I think it would be bad news. Uh, I think I have real concerns about the UAE and human rights. I had a constituent, Matthew Hedges, who was imprisoned and tortured there for a year. There are British prisoners who've languished in jails there for years and uh, nothing is done. Uh, we've got the COP coming up, uh, all this greenwashing and making money for oil revenue. It doesn't sound to me in our democratic interest, and I hope, hope the government does call it in in that respect, um, because I think we need a plural media in this country, but uh, it doesn't particularly bother me about the Telegraph because it's not read by people who vote Labour generally. <laughs> Well, I would worry about the mirror if it was going through the same <laughs> process. So, uh, um, look, there are a group of us who are concerned about this as Conservative MPs, and we are looking at how we make our views known. Um, but there are concerns, not least because if you look at the uh, approach by the Emirati government to media freedom in their own country, uh, I think that gives you pause for concern about what it would mean in ours. Um, as Ben rightly says, Matthew Hedges was held. We currently have another British national who's being held hostage. Actually, that's something I want to see the Prime Minister and David Cameron raising when they go uh, to the Emirates for COP. 28. But there are real pauses for concern about this. And, you know, William Hague has been very outspoken about it. Many others have. So I think this is very much something you'll hear more about. You say you're thinking about how to make your views mm. heard. What, what, what do you mean by that? So essentially, obviously, we'll be having private conversations um, behind the scenes, but we're looking at whether we want to do something more public as well. OK, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, interesting uh, topic. Still to come on the Politics Hub. Plans to force teachers to keep schools open when they go on strike. We'll hear from one union boss who thinks it's an attack on teachers' democratic rights.
Hello, welcome back. Now, teachers could be forced to keep schools open when they go on strike under plans announced today. Ministers want to introduce minimum service levels from the next academic year to keep classrooms operating. Education Secretary Julian Keegan said the teacher strikes were some of the most disruptive on record, with 25 million days lost and said pupils can't afford a repeat of that disruption. Now, we're going to hear from the leader of the UK's biggest education union and his reaction in a moment. But first, though, here's Sky's political correspondent, Amanda Acas, who is here. Good to have you on the programme. Uh, so what's the idea behind this, then? Yes, so it's not surprising that the teaching unions are extremely angry about this. They're describing it as shameful, an attempt to restrict their democratic freedoms and right to strike. But the government say they've really got no choice but to act to avoid the kind of disruption we saw over the past year during those 10 days of strike action, particularly for children who had already had so much disruption to their education because of COVID. Now, earlier I spoke to Gillian Keegan, the Education Secretary, and she insisted this isn't an attack on the rights to take industrial action, but it's about protecting people pupils than their parents. We are still supporting the fundamental right to strike, but we're trying to balance that with the fundamental right of a child to an education as well. And for students to be able to sit exams, for example, these, are, these have a massive impact on young people and on their parents. So what we're trying to do is just balance those two rights. And quite often you will see that schools do a lot to support those children anyway. Obviously they care uh, to make sure that they support the children in their care. But what we want to do is make that uniform across the country so we know uh, what this what this will be and we, we can provide that certainty for parents and that's not unlike and it's not unusual it happens in many schools across other parts of the world. Now, part of the union anger about all of this is that just a month ago, the government was saying they were trying to reach a voluntary agreement with the unions and they were having negotiations about all of this, but that seems to have completely broken down. The unions say the government have been bullying them, being disingenuous. The government say, well, they, well, they won't budge from their, their belief that they have a right to strike and that they don't agree with the principle. Um, but effectively, the government are pushing ahead with their own consultation based on these new laws, which were initially introduced by Liz Truss when she was talking really tough on the unions, um, which were part through this summer and basically they're consulting on two main options and um, so the first one is about prioritizing the most vulnerable children and those who are about to take exams as well as the children of key workers the second one they're looking at is trying to keep education open for all primary school children but just prioritizing some groups of secondary school children head teachers would sort of if a strike is announced they'd then draw up the plan and say these specific people would have to work in order to reach that minimum level and if there are really long -term term strikes as well, there'll be some kind of rotor system brought in. Um, but clearly, it's something that's very controversial. It's affecting other public sector workers, railway workers, ambulance, NHS workers too. Labour say they'd repeal it, this whole legislation, if, if they come in. But at the moment, it's going to be a nine-week consultation. The government say it'll be in place by the next academic year. There we go. Uh, thank you, uh, Amanda. Well, we heard, didn't we, from um, Amanda's interview uh, with the Education Secretary. Let's hear now from oh, let's hear now from the General Secretary of the National Education Union, got the right camera finally, uh, Daniel Kabudi for his reaction. I mean, this is really draconian legislation. Um, instead of dealing with the real issues that lead to strike action, such as uh, mass dis discontent amongst the profession due to rocketing workloads, plummeting pay, this government seems to be tough on strikes, but not on the causes of strikes. I guess the government would say um, that it's trying to protect children uh, and parents. You know, they want minimum service levels so vulnerable children can go to school. They want rotors uh, so that if strikes last five days or more, then kids can attend. Is that not a good idea? Well, I think the priority, the government have the wrong priorities uh, is the, the real message that we are all getting from this. We all want to see minimum service levels in education. That's why we want every child taught by a qualified teacher. We want every child in a class size uh, with fewer than 30. We want every child in a school that is funded properly. The government really do have the wrong priorities. Education time... should be their focus. Just to try and jump in, um, do you have an issue with the minimum service levels in strikes or do you just think that, OK, it's fine, but it's just not the priority that we would choose? Which is it, just specifically on the, you know, on the levels of service on strike days? Well, I think it is fundamentally wrong to remove uh, the, the most basic democratic 
right from school staff to withdraw your labour. Um, in 2016, David Davis said that the Trade Union Act was fitting for Franco's Spain. Uh, elements of the consultation mean that it will be completely outlawed to take strike action in uh, big areas of education. So what the government are suggesting is much worse than that. In fact, this is, le this is legislation really lifted from Chile in the 1980s. You think it's legislation lifted from Chile in the 1980s? Absolutely. The, re the removal of the absolutely fundamental democratic right to withdraw Labour and take strike action is an absolute attack on democracy. And that is what we're seeing from this government. I mean, they I guess they would say that, that you can right. still strike. There just has to be a minimum level of service. Do you not accept that that's a but, level to strike? If you look at the consultation uh, and the areas of minimum service levels that the government are proposing, you're looking at 74% uh, of children uh, of, of the school uh, establishment being still in school, you know, essentially outlawing pr uh, strike action in primary schools, in special educational needs schools. You know, instead, the government should be focusing on the key issues that uh, lead to strike action rather than removing uh, hard won and hard fought for democratic freedoms. I just want to take my presenter's hat off for a minute, uh, if I can, and just try and articulate what mm -hmm. I think. You know, some parents might be thinking, because I think most parents mm -hmm. love teachers, right? We, we want teachers to be well paid. Absolutely. We see how hard teachers work, how important they are to our kids. So, you know, on the side mm -hmm. of teachers, totally get it. But then I guess some parents might also be thinking, gosh, my child's missed an awful lot of school uh, last year. And they might be worried about what mm -hmm. that means for their education, having to kind of resettle them, what it means for their friendship groups for young kids as well. And I guess secretly some parents mm -hmm. might be thinking, yeah, look, I really support teachers, I wish they got paid more money, but actually maybe this is quite good if schools can't shut during strikes. What would you say to those parents? Well, we stand with parents and we want to see an education system that's fully funded with school staff that are properly paid, with manageable workloads, an education system in which every child can flourish. The reason uh, the strike action was so well supported last year by parents uh, was because they understand, actually, that is not the education system that this current government is delivering. That's, as I reiterate, the focus of what this government should have. Uh, which is on the quality of education, be tough on the causes of strikes, rather than trying to remove uh, the democratic right to take strike action if needed. Now, this is the first time I've interviewed you um, after you became leader of the mm. NEU, so I just want to get a bit more of a sense about who yeah. you are and you, what your sort of priorities are. You once compared, back in 2019, private schools to apartheid. What did you mean by that? Mm. Well, I uh, just meant that there was a, a disconnect, so there was not a unity in terms of education. You know, there was a separation where, uh, you know, if you could afford um, more uh, a, a, a private education, that that's where you would, would go, and that then the comprehensive education, which uh, politicians don't tend to use uh, for their children, you know, has been fundamentally attacked over a decade-long uh, decade-long uh, series of cuts and austerity. Do you think that private schools are damaging for society? I think private schools at the moment are currently under attack uh, in terms of the school staff who currently work within them. We're seeing lots of disputes at the moment as uh, private schools look to move away from the teachers' pension scheme. And, you know, we are, as a union are very clear that we will stand uh, with those members and defend their terms and conditions. That's we are absolutely committed them, in the Do you national... think that private schools are damaging to society? What I, want, what I want to see, Sophie, is comprehensive education so well funded, so uh, well resourced um, that, you know, the, the desire to go to private education becomes obsolete. OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. The head of the NEU Education Union there. Now, you'll know the story already. A diplomatic row 
has erupted between Greece and the UK over the Elgin Marbles. Now, Rishi Sunak was meant to be hosting the Greek Prime Minister for a bilateral meeting today to discuss, among other things, the pressing issue of illegal migration. But the meeting was called off at the 11th hour because of a row about the Elgin Marbles. The Prime Minister is said to have been irritated by remarks that his Greek counterpart made in an interview at the weekend that splitting the Elgin Marbles between Greece and the UK is like cutting the Mona Lisa in half. Sky's political correspondent Ali Fortescue reports. Hello. Hello. A world leader in the UK for high-level diplomatic talks. Not with the Prime Minister, though, but the man who wants to replace him. On the economy, it's a really strong story, isn't it? It was around this time that Rishi Sunak disinvited the Greek leader from a meeting in Number 10, an age-old cultural debate igniting a fresh diplomatic row. It's very clear that the Elgin marbles are actually protected under law, and under that law, they have to stay in the British Museum. The Greek Prime Minister was offered a meeting with the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, and, and, of course, we do value our relationship with Greece and we work a lot in partnership. The location of the Parthenon marbles in the British Museum has been fiercely contested for decades. On the weekend, the Greek Prime Minister compared it to the Mona Lisa being cut in half. After raising the subject, he was swiftly snubbed by the British government and headed home early. The Greek side have called this a bad day for relations between London and Athens. And it is highly unusual for this sort of high-level meeting to be cancelled at such short notice. Particularly surprising, I think, for a Prime Minister who's wanted to be different from his predecessors, not pick fights and set a new tone in international relations. I think there are two reasons why Rishi Sunak may have wanted this row. One, and both are not particularly attractive. One is a personal one, which is he simply has a thin skin and was cheesed off and decided, I'm not going to meet this guy. And the second is, I think, worse, which is that people on one side are depicted as kind of unpatriotic and doing down Britain, and people on the other side are seen as doing up Britain and defending our heritage. And if he wants to make the Parthenon sculptures a culture war, I think that's pretty unattractive. British politics may be at play, but it is a row that obviously resonates a long way from Westminster. This was not a friendly behaviour. Our relationship come from the too far from the past, and they will go too far in the future. We share the same values. We fought together in two world wars. We were always together, and this was not the right behavior from your prime minister to our prime minister. The fate of the Elgin marbles, whether they'll ever make it back to the Acropolis, isn't just about history, but about politics too. And this has now turned into a genuine diplomatic row between the UK and one of its closest allies. Ali Fortescue, Sky News. All right, let's talk to Alicia and Ben. But Ben, you, this is an issue that you feel strongly about. Well, I'm, I'm in favour of the reunification of the, uh, of the Parthenon sculptures. I think if, if we'd, someone had carried away half of Stonehenge 200 years ago, we'd feel the same as, as the Greeks. And actually, there's a very good deal on the table supported by the former Conservative Chancellor, um, who now chairs the British uh, mu Museum, to have a cultural exchange which would involve them going back to Athens in exchange for amazing artefacts we've never seen here coming to the British Museum. But even whatever your view on it is, why Rishi Sunak thought it was a good idea to have this row with a friendly country, with a centre-right prime minister who faces a lot of the same challenges as he does, is completely beyond me. And it either exposes really bad advice inside number 10, or he, see, he thinks maybe that driving these culture wars helps him politically. I don't think it will on this, because all the polls show the majority of the British public support reunification, and they don't really understand why this row has been confected. What? I mean, from a diplomatic perspective, mm. this does feel quite bonkers. Um, so I struggle <laughs> to understand why the decision was made that was. Um, it does feel difficult to believe that this was on the basis of the Elgin Marbles, that a meeting mm. was cancelled with a NATO ally um, with whom we have an important relationship and important discussions to have. Um, you know, Rishi Sunak doesn't travel that much mm. um, as Prime Minister. Um, so I would have done everything I could have to have protected that meeting. Um, and I struggle to believe that most former Prime Ministers haven't had a conversation about the Elgin Marbles with our Greek counterparts at some point. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is going on then? 
I honestly don't know. Um, maybe enough. it was about that. Maybe it was about something else. He could have seen him and just said no. He could have repeated the long-standing British government position, which is a matter for the British Museum. But to, but to engineer this row, it's, it is bonkers. And, uh... and by law, it is a matter for the British Museum. That's what the bill that we passed mm. in 1963. Um, so we said that the British Museum were the ones to decide. And you look at their previous statements, they don't particularly want it to be a government-to-government -government issue. And you know, if you look at other countries, I mean, the Parthenon is also in uh, the Vatican Museum. It's in the Copenhagen. Hagen Museum, it's in, uh, oh God, I'm trying to remember the other places, Vienna, Germany, um, France, the Louvre. You know, it's not unique to the UK here, the issues around what happened to Pantheon when it was spread around the world. But we have said it's for the British Museum by law to determine. And you see other countries around the world doing exchanges, just like Ben yeah. said. Um, just to kind of put the counterpoint, where do you sort of draw the line? Because, you know, with works of art, who do they belong to? Do they not belong to all of us as, as viewers? You know, you'll see wonderful European art in American museums, for example. I, I get that argument, but I do think... I do think the, the Parthenon sculptures are, are, are a special case. I mean, if you have any, if you, I don't know if you've been, had the uh, fortune to go to the new museum in Athens, it's amazing, and half of the frieze is there in situ, the other half is in the British... Uh, museum, and I just think you know this is the cradle of European civilization, ancient uh, Greece. Uh, whatever you think of how the how the sculptures came to be here, it wasn't a very um, you know attractive story, and we would do an awful lot of good for our PR as a country, which we need at the moment, but also. It's a win-win because we'd get amazing stuff that's never been seen here and has never, never left Greece in return for the sculptures being reunited. So I think you can make a special case for the Parthenon sculptures. What, what do you think, Alicia? So I'm not sure quite where I sit on this and, you know, quite clearly it's not for me to determine. Um, but I think Mary Beard made a point about, you know, what are we saying about great cultural artefacts? Do they only belong to the place where they've created or is there a, an international kind of culture, a, a joint belongingness that exists? And I'm not sure really where I sit on that scale, but I, I do think it's a really difficult one because we have amazing things in our museums, whether it's in Oxford or whether it's in London or anywhere else in the country. Um, and there are amazing British things that are in museums around the world. I don't see us running around saying you must immediately return this. But then there is a history over the last 10 years of exchanges yeah. um, between all sorts of museums. But again, without government and politicians interfering, and I'm a big fan of small government, so let's stay out of this one as well. <laughs> uh, thanks both. Uh, lovely uh, to speak to you both about this. Um, now, still to come on the Politics Hub, how people behave when diplomacy fails. Finders keepers, losers weepers. The Elgin marbles are ours. Got that, Greeks? Good. It was an exciting night, um, meeting all these great people who support conservation. Um, so exciting, and yeah, I had the privilege to be with the Prince of Wales. Uh, we sat side by side, and you know, he's just a big supporter and fan of conservation uh, across the world. So yeah, it was really, really an and why honor. Why did you win the there. award? What was it for? Um, so my award um, is based on our work back in Cameroon. I work on great apes, chimpanzees, and, and gorillas, and we do community conservation. So the area we work is called the Ebo Forest. It's not a protected area, but since 2012, we've been working with grassroots communities for them to conserve, you know, this great biodiversity that they have. And, and what was the prince asking you about? Oh, yeah, the prince was asking about my work. Um, so he was really excited about the fact that um, we observe um, chimpanzees cracking nuts in the Ebo forest. And that was um, a novel behavior um, of chimps uh, on this side of uh, Central Africa. So he was really excited about that and wanted to know a bit more. So our work is actually um, building capacity in grassroots communities to um, protect what they, what they have, um, because these communities, their history, ancestry, live loot, everything is tied to this forest. Um, so there are actually some threats, you know, to the chimpanzees, gorillas, and all the wildlife in the, in the what forest. What sort of threat? Um, so we have uh, mainly uh, habitat loss, um, which is um, linked to um, agri uh, agriculture. Is also linked to uh, logging and also the expansion of agro-industry. Um, and this also um, facilitates uh, hunting and the bushmeat trade. 
So these are some of the things we're working with the local communities so they can actually monitor the wildlife in their forest. Um, they carry out alternative livelihood activities to reduce the pressure on the forest. If you see how intelligent these animals are, then you just, you know, see like, I mean, they are just so much like you and I. But yeah, they live in the forest and as a result, you know, we who are privileged to, you know, be able to do things that uh, you know, harming them, we should also be doing things that can safeguard these animals. Hello, welcome back. Now, there was speculation today that the row over the Elgin Marvels was intentional. Some of the more excitable folk here in Westminster wondered if it could be Rishi Sunak attempting to whip up an issue to distract from soaring migration, or his party's performance in the polls, the classic dead cat. But in politics, it often tends to be cock up rather than conspiracy. Tempers can flare, things can get personal. So we thought we'd bring you some of the other political snubs. Too fast. Let's chat to Alyssa and Ben. Some of those were really a bit painful. Felt a bit sorry for I them. I almost felt sorry for Theresa May in that one. Um, I'm not sure about the others though. <laughs> Um, it is any, any political snubs from you guys? Any times you felt? Uh, well, I was uh, yes. I, when I was a foreign office minister, um, the prime minister of Indonesia uh, uh, said gave an interview to a BBC colleague of yours, uh, saying that I would be refused entry to his country um, because I was in a civil partnership with my gay husband. Oh, oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> which uh, which, a... which were quite useful at cutting down the number of number of numbers of countries oh, I had to visit in my time as a foreign office minister. That's extraordinary. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it, it, uh, it was it was a it was a big piece in the Sun newspaper at the time. But um, I think we I'm moved sorry, on. that's actually kind that's of awful. outrageous. Well, and outrageous. We, we, we easily forget what things were like back then. I mean, mm. I, there was a time when the Foreign Office, if you were a diplomat, you weren't allowed to take oh. your same sex husband or partner abroad with you. So they only apologised them two years ago that well, you yeah, couldn't yeah. be gay so, and be in the Foreign Service. So these, these changes are quite, are, are quite recent, but it, um, it caused me some hilarity because I didn't have a particular desire to go to Indonesia because a, a, a lot of other countries are, were more important to us and I wanted to go to anyway. So. Yeah, cut down the list of it places list, for yeah. holiday destinations. That's yeah. fair. How about you? Yeah. So mine's probably a bit more light-hearted, but when I was a, a civil servant working at the Syria peace talks in Geneva, the Russians decided that I was some kind of spy set there to kind of upset Lavrov during his press conferences. Um, so they, on the first day, they said, you can't be here anymore. And luckily, all the journalists around me said, yes, you can. What are you talking about? The next day, they actually tried to throw me out. And luckily, the other ambassador stood up for me and said, if you're throwing her out, you're throwing us out. The third day, they put a lock on the door to keep us out. <laughs> and essentially, yeah, Lavrov had insisted that I should not be allowed to be in the same room during his press conferences because I was so distracting and I was somehow feeding, you know, undermining him during his press conferences. Um, so, yeah, so Lavrov tried to get me thrown out of the UN building and failed. That's quite good. I'm banned from Russia. Ditto. Wow. Just, and yeah. also a few other countries. I've just defamed yeah, Indonesia, list. by the way, because it was Malaysia, I, re re oh, I recall. No, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> In Indonesia is a lovely country, I love it. <laughs> Uh, I've been there many times. Yeah, <laughs> brain, yeah, yeah. brain, 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 brain it's fade there. Fine. We'll move it was Malaysia. It was um, the then prime minister. You're going to have to. <laughs> you're going to have to book a holiday to Indonesia now. <laughs> yes. I see you off here. Yeah. <laughs> to put it on your Instagram. How beautiful Indonesia is. <laughs> It's all right. uh, it was a very fast connection, correction. I think we got away from it. I'm glad it. I got it on air. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Oh. oh, dear. Oh, dear. I'm sorry. I need to recover from that. <laughs> well, at least you had your first ever laughing fit on air the other day. Oh, yeah. This so, was with John Craig. But wasn't you, weren't you in the studio again that night? No. Not oh, not right. I think it was. I think it was, um, yeah, it was John Craig. Uh, 
recounting the change Yes, let's not repeat why or... Uh, yeah, it, we've had a lot of that. Uh, it, yeah, there's been lots of um, yeah. comments about what James Cleverly did or didn't say uh, about Stockton. Mm, yeah. um, very serious story, but John Craig, you, I mean, yeah, he's just such a raconteur, it's difficult to mm. um, keep a straight yes, face indeed. sometimes. Um, but, yeah, diplomatic slubs. Um, how much of a difficult... Um, how difficult do you think it's going to be for Rishi Sunak to repair his relationship with Greece? I think it's going to be really difficult because countries work for years to get inward visits to the UK. So it's a very big deal when the UK goes to a country. But actually, when I've visited anywhere in the world, actually what they really want is an invitation to the UK. Um, that, for them, is far more important because it's about their own electorate, uh, own electorate and what they see. Um, so the Greek Prime Minister will be feeling deeply frustrated. This would be one of the most important meetings. Um, and it was declined. And not only was it declined, it was publicly snubbed. So this is going to be really difficult. And Greece is a partner that we're wanting to work more with, whether it be on migration or whether it's a NATO partner. Um, so there is going to be a lot of hard work for David Cameron to get cracking on. And actually, Rishi himself will need to do it. He won't be able to rely on the Foreign Secretary to fix it. Or we can do it in government. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Well... Uh, we'll be trying to scrutinise the body language <laughs> the next time. Can yeah. you imagine the next time Rishi Sunak oh. bumps into... It's going to be like Theresa May all over again. Him. This yeah. is the point. So, it's going to be difficult. You do have to give tough messages, but it'd be more important to be in the room and say no than to not have the meeting. Thanks very much. We're now out of time. That's it from us for us tonight. I'll see you tomorrow at 7pm. Up next, it is Sarah-Jane Mee with The UK Tonight. See you tomorrow. <laughs>